Okay, so let's start writing some part of this uh, exercise just to practice a bit on all these uh, objects and callback stuff. Uh, it's asking us to write a simple program uh, using objects and functional programming methods. So just what we discussed uh, time, uh, some minutes ago. Uh, to manage uh, some objects that contain information about question and answers. Okay. So uh, here the text describes uh, the contents of the type of objects that we have. An answer that, oh, sorry, that contains uh, a response, uh, the name of the respondent, uh, a score, and a date. Uh, and a question that contains a text of the question, the name of the questioner or the person who asked the question, a date, and a list of answers. List meaning an array in JavaScript. Okay? Uh, so we have to create these two types of objects. Uh, by creating the two constructor functions that fill uh, those fields hmm? uh, for question and for answer. And then to implement some methods, uh, let's call them methods, okay, we are friends, so we, we can use, uh, we, 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 we can abuse uh, this definition, add, find all, after, list, and so on. Uh, so. uh, and, okay, creating an instance of question with some four answers uh, just for testing uh, what uh, uh, for testing the method that we are writing. So uh, we can create a new file. We can call it uh, inside week two uh, QA.js. It's exercise three. Use strict. And let's uh, cause other stuff. So let's create a constructor function for these two objects, uh, which is sim simpler than we think that because uh, uh, we have no types uh, to specify. Okay, so we just uh, the name of the fields. So we can define a function for creating a new answer. I prefer to use the, the syntax with an explicit declaration just to make it more visible, but any other syntax will do. Since it's a constructor function, I use a, a capital letter. And for constructing a new answer, I need a response text, a respondent name, a score, and a date. Four parameters. So it will be the text, the author, the score, and the date. And I just need to store these four pieces of information as four attributes of my object. This does, does text. Text equal to text. This does author equal to author. And this dot score. And this dot date. Okay, right now it's very stupid. I, I'm not doing any validation, any check, uh, whatever. Okay, the stuff is just simple. Um, and the other one is the sorry, definition of a question that contains only three parameters the text of the question, the author, and the date, because the list of answers starts empty and will be, of course, increased as we add the new answers with the add method. Okay, so we don't provide a fourth parameter with the list of answers because when we create a question, we don't have any answers yet. So we can create a function question with the text of the question, with the author of the question, and with the date. And we initialize an object with the same names of the attributes, this dot author equal to author, and this dot uh, uh, date equal to date, and finally this dot uh, answers, answers equal to the empty list. We have a list for storing the answers, but references to the answers. 
which for now, when we are creating a new question, will be empty by definition of new. If it's new, nobody answered it yet. Okay, so the difference is that answer is just a, a dumb object, just a container of values, while question is an object with some behaviors, with some methods, let's call them. Um, and uh, the simplest one is the add method. So all, these are all functions attached to this property of the question object. Add requires an answer object, and that will be added to the list. That's quite easy, sorry, to implement. We just have this dot add equal. So I'm creating a new method, new attribute, and this attribute will be, will be a function. So whether you are more familiar with the arrow syntax or with the uh, traditional function, maybe you can also write it. Just let's try to use both because they are equivalent. Function that uh, doesn't, oh sorry, gets an answer as a parameter and what it does is uh, pushes this answer at the end of the list of answers of the question object. Okay, let's see if it works. Const question one. What they, sorry, new question where the text is what day is it, the author is uh, me, and the date, uh, let's write a string, then we talk a bit about the dates. 2023, 03, 07. And then I can add one answer to this question. Q1.add a new answer. And I give the parameters for constructing the answer. The first answer would be is uh, Tuesday. The author name is a clever guy. The score of this answer is maybe start with zero, then people can upvote or downvote the answer. And the data is again today, 2023, 03, or 07. And then we can print Q1. Or we should inspect in some way what it's doing. So if you run it, it will happen in the debug console here. You see that, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, you see what it printed, it printed uh, the object Q1 with the text, uh, author, date, uh, and then answers tells me that's an array of one element, uh, but I cannot see it uh, right now, okay? One way, uh, we cannot see it because the, the program is finished, uh, so the debugger is already shut down. One trick for helping us debug this stuff uh, is to write a debugger statement at the end. Debugger, okay, you can set a manually a breakpoint and so on, but otherwise you just write a debugger statement uh, and it's X, uh, as a pre uh, it behaves like a breakpoint. Just it's an instruction in JavaScript. So if you run this again, 
it will execute the program and then stop it here when it hits the debugger statement. Is the program asking for help? Uh, please uh, open the debugger. And so at this point, we can also in the, well, we can check the variables both in the debugger mode. Sorry that this Q1 contains the answers and the answer zero contains this information that we just set. So the answer text was Tuesday. So we can inspect the variables inside the debugger itself or the console becomes uh, say intelligent and so we can, we, if we load something, we can inspect uh, the details of uh, the answer directly in the, in the console also because the debugger is still active. So let us, it will let us also inspect the values that are being logged. So it's uh, when you are doing something a bit complex, uh, it's, you, you can just insert this statement uh, and the Visual Studio will stop uh, with all the information that you need. When you stop the debugger, of course, you're losing this, cap this interactive capability. Um, okay. Oops. What are the other requirements of this exercise? Find all name returns all the answers of a given person. So it's a method of question. I'm asking to the question, please give me all the answers that was replied to that question by a, a specific person. And this is a good job for filter. So this dot, uh, uh, the method was called uh, find all. And uh, would be a function where the name is uh, uh, the author. The parameter that we need. I give, give you an author and just, just give me all the answers of that author. Well, this is simple because I just need to return the list of answers filtered by the author name. So it will be just uh, this, dot answers, dot filter, And the callback to this filter would be the check whether for a given answer A, if the author of that answer, A dot author, is equal to author. So maybe let's format it a bit better so we can read what you're doing. So find all is a function with one parameter, author. This function contains only one statement, the return statement, and return returns an expression based on a filter of the answers. And the filter just checks for every author whether the author attribute of, of that answer is equal to author, which is the argument of this function. So it's again a closure over the argument of the function. And we can see whether the uh, q1 dot find all the answers by clever guy it should find one, and if I search for the answers by other guy, it should find none. Okay, so you see that in the first case, it, the result of this logging line 28, uh, finding all the answers by clever guy is an array of one element. And this element, of course, we just have one response here, so it's easy. And if I'm putting another name, uh, I just get an array of zero elements, the empty array.
Okay. This function can be, if we want to use arrow function with a simplified syntax, uh, we could also write it in this way. Find all function. Oh, sorry, author. This dot answers dot filters like this, this expression like this. This is the same way, the same function. just with less braces and without the return statement. Because it's implicit that if we don't have the braces, uh, the expression value will be returned, okay? Uh, after date, uh, well, we'll do the same. List by date, uh, after date will be the same uh, returns an array of answers after the given date. Okay. So the comparison will not be by name of the author, but value of the date. Okay, since we are talking about dates, we need to spend uh, some time in checking uh, how to manage dates in, uh, in JavaScript. Um, right now I just put some strings and I've been careful to put the strings in the, in the ISO format, so year, dash, month, dash, day, so they are readable they, and they compare easily because if I compare them as strings, I will get the, the uh, normal calendar order. So it's the only format of data that makes sense in programming. Of course, uh, in the uh, standard library of JavaScript, we have an object called date, which is terrible. Okay, probably I think it's a, a law of nature that every new language uh, defines a very bad uh, date and time library, in, date and time objects in the standard libraries. So Java was terrible, the JavaScript is terrible also in its uh, uh, description of the date object. Data, okay, looks like an object. It's, we, we can create a new date with a constructor function, but internally it's just a, a, a millisecond value. So it has no notion of uh, time zones, local time, stuff like that, and no notion of uh, um, daily saving times uh, or other things that make uh, uh, time and date processing interesting. Hmm? We have a constructor that can construct a date from the components, uh, uh, but they are all uh, mandatory. What it means is that uh, with a date object, I cannot really say the concept of today, the 7 March 2023. I can only select an instant in time. So, when the 7 March 2023 at midnight or at midday or at uh, what is now 11, uh, 12 or 2. So it's called date, uh, but it's actually a time and date instant. And it's get complicated because uh, you have no way of uh, making the difference between today and today at midnight because they should be represented in the same way. And there are also interesting games uh, around midnight uh, when you have a uh, uh, local time different from the server time. So especially on the web, the, now, the current date on the browser of the user is different from the current date on the server. So when you check the AC, you always I mean, sometimes you find that the server register recorded something in the, in the day before or in the day after. Hmm? So it's better. It's bad. Uh, if you print a data, the format in which it's printed depends on the language of your computer. So if you convert a date into a string, what you get into the string is unpredictable. Hmm? Too bad. Um, 
for example, you see that I try to create a date 18 March 2020 by giving a properly formatted uh, time string or uh, say locally formatted time string 18 March. So the date object does it, but it will create a different date. One will be on the, on the 11 in the night on the, 20, on the 17th because in a way we'll interpret this uh, local time and then we'll roll it back to the universal time. Why this convention is not done here? So there are a lot of surprises, okay? More than the average JavaScript code. Um, so well, that was of course the, the, the reason why a lot of uh, libraries uh, were published, are published uh, for just for this reason. Library for handling dates and times in a more, uh, say, easy way and uh, with less uh, surprises. Uh, I linked uh, probably the four or five more, um, say, popular ones. You can pick what you want. Uh, the, what, the moment JS was very famous uh, until a point where some people started to complain that it was too large, too big, too many kilobytes. And so nobody wanted to use it anymore because Chrome started to, st uh, to, to print some warning. You are using a, a huge library. And so people started to move to, to different, uh, because it was the most complex, uh, complete one also. But anyway, you can choose the one you want. Uh, maybe we can, in this course, we selected DayJS, but uh, they are slightly different. Uh, they are all well supported. So, okay. Uh, the JS is a very small library that uh, creates a set of objects. So instead of creating a new day, you create an object that is called DJS. And then this object has some um, properties and methods that you can use for doing comparison, differences, uh, certain dates, certain times, and so on. Okay. But this is also, um, so the, the documentation of the JS is quite clear, so we are not uh, spending a lot of time here. But it's also our first time in which uh, we are uh, using an external library in our code. Okay, so how does it work? We cannot just use something, okay? We need uh, to create a project, a JavaScript project, and this project will have an associated set of libraries in addition to the code that we write. And the projects in, uh, in JavaScript are handled by this npm command that is the package manager for, for Node.js, Node package manager. So what we need to do is to create, let's go back to our project. Right now we have this uh, QA file together with other files. It's better to create a separate directory for each project so that the dependencies or the libraries can be separated from the others. So we can create a subdirectory here, new folder, exercise three, and we move the QA file inside this folder. Yes, I'm sure. And, okay, right now it's just a folder. I go to the console, the terminal, sorry. So from week two, I move into exercise three, which is just, okay, just contain this file. Now I initialize a new project based uh, uh, on this directory. The command is npm init. So we are creating a project with a common npm init. And we, this will create a file called package.json that contains all the dependencies, all the libraries and the packages that are needed for running my project. Um, just some questions. Name of the package, exercise three is very fine. Version, description, exercise three. Week two, whatever. Entry point is the file that should be run when we run this project. 
Since we are creating a project with many files, uh, it needs to know where to start the execution. QRJS, because we only find, we already found one only file in this directory, so there was an easy choice. If there are no files in the directory, we will uh, suggest something like, I don't remember if index.js, probably. But you can change it. Test command, we are not running tests. Uh, Git repository for now is not, uh, you don't have a repository for this. Keywords, uh, author, license, okay. So just creating a lot of metadata. Is this okay? Yes. So what happened is that after answering these questions, a package.json file has been created that basically contains uh, the instruction for which is the main module of, the, of our project. And we can run it, okay? Nothing changed. Uh, sorry, not, not running this one, running that. Nothing changed, okay? We are just in a separate directory. But uh, uh, now we can add some packages with the command npm install. npm install will uh, find a package, download it from the internet, add the dependency into the file package.json, and uh, uh, create another file which is called packet.lock.json uh, and create a directory called node modules in which you store a copy of the module, okay? The first time we provide npm install with the name of the library, we want to use the day.js library, so it's called day.js. Sorry, yeah. And npm install day.js. Close the bug, I don't need it. So this was easy, was quick, and if we see on the folder it created it, modified package.json, because now it contains the dependencies item that was not there before. So every time I install something, it will store it into the dependencies. Later on, we'll learn that there are two types of dependencies, dependency for development and dependency for production. So there will be two sections, but for now we don't need that. Uh, and this package has been installed into this project. And inside the node modules folder, I, we have a new module folder created that contains a DJS that contains the actual library, the source of the actual library. Okay, so this is the normal, when we install something, we install it into the project. It's important to keep package.json because the information packet to JSON can be used to recreate the project somewhere else. So if we commit to GitHub, of course, we don't want to commit node modules. Right now, it's small, but in general, we may have several megabytes of libraries there. In fact, if we want to, we can also delete the node modules folder. And we can recreate it anytime, but just by running npm install without any further argument. You will read the dependencies and download all of them. So normally you ship a project with the package.json and the people, just the first time, the first thing they do is npm install and they recreate all the libraries. With the, uh, here we have a, a version number, but package lock contains uh, the version numbers of the modules with all the signatures and also all the dependencies. So right now, DJS doesn't have any dependency, but if we install the package with some dependencies in uh, the package.json, we only get the top level uh, packages. But in the package block, we have all the full list of the packages that have been loaded with the, with the data, with the, so uh, it's useful for locking the version of a package to the specific instance that we have today. So even if the packet changes, uh, other people will always use the version that we were using. If you want to update to a newer version, of course, you delete the lock and uh, you let it recreate uh, with the current values. Hmm? So it's a, there's a lot of option, options the, the, and comments. The easy, the easy part was just to init and install, the two main comments. 
Okay, this means that in our QA file, we can now use the functions or the objects uh, uh, provided by the library. In Node.js, the syntax for accessing some resource declared in the library is called a require. Require. Require is a function whose argument is the name of the library and will return an object provided by the library itself. So in our case, in DJS, the, where is the, yeah, the slides here, DJS is the name of the library and will return DJS, which is a function that we use to construct objects. So some libraries uh, return functions, some libraries return objects, some libraries return uh, uh, a list of functions depends on, on the library. No? Require is basically the import statement in Node.js. Uh, give me something that I can use. So in this case, const dejs is require dejs. In Node, there is no real notion of modules. No? In other languages, if it were Python, this would be a module name. If we were Java, this would be a package name. Okay? No, it's, it isn't any of them. It's just a, a value, which in most of the cases is a function or an object returned by, by the library. Hmm? Uh, and it depends on the, you need to check the documentation of the library. There are actually two mechanisms for importing modules. One is on, on, on Node.js which uses the require function. And we see inside in the browser, where the more recent version of JavaScript is implemented, we use a separate, uh, uh, say, set of commands, which is made on import and export hmm, statements. So uh, we need to use a different, uh, slightly different conventions for importing on, on Node.js or on the browser. But we'll come to that. So what do the JS does? What does JS do? Sorry, um, we can create a new object and uh, have some. Here, here are some some examples for creating new objects starting from dates. And there are some options for printing dates here, and some operators for extracting or setting the single components of the dates. So if some of them are not uh, defined, uh, they are not forced to be zero, they're just undefined. And then there are operations for adding data, subtracting, computing the differences in maybe days, minutes, seconds, whatever. Uh, is before, is after. That would be useful for us. A date is between other two. And so there are a lot of, uh, uh, say, predefined methods. And especially there's a system of uh, of plugins. So the, the, the library itself uh, gives you a minimal amount of function, and if you want more uh, on, the, on the website uh, that I forgot to open, thejs.js.org, okay, you see that uh, uh, we have a set of uh, basic functionality, but also a uh, large set of plugins uh, if you need some extra for example the is between uh, or is today are in a separate plugin so they need to be installed separately so we, we will do an npm install of the plugin and then require the plugin itself loading plugin node means uh, uh, okay uh, another require for the plugin itself The, we will see some, just some little code right now, and then in the lab of this Thursday, uh, you will have more time also to, um, to have a look at the documentation. So just have a browse the, the website. There are quite extensive uh, set of doc documentation and, uh, and uh, um, uh, sorry, and examples. Hmm? Okay, so coming to our example, uh, maybe we don't want to store the date as a string, 
but uh, if we prefer to store it as an object, we should decide whether the parameter of the constructor is still a string and then will be stored as an object, or if we require the user to provide the, an object. Maybe we can provide this as a string and then store it as an object here, like, like that. And the same goes here, the AJS. So we are receiving a string as a parameter, but we are by JS. But we are storing an object. How does it work? Okay, when we run it, what we get is that, uh, uh, for example, the question one contains one date object, which is, uh, it's formatted like this, which is the default formatting. But if you open it, you see that it's composed of many different fields, separate fields. Uh, and you can access all these fields uh, through the different methods uh, that the object will provide. Oh, for example, uh, set, uh, locale, and so on, that are in the documentation. Um, and you see, it's, again, it's strange because it's uh, yesterday's date at 11 o'clock. Because uh, it assumed that it was midnight uh, in, uh, in lo my local time, which was 11 o'clock uh, in, in Greenwich time. Okay, so it's something that we must be careful when we convert uh, times and dates. Right now, okay, it's not very dangerous because we are only on one computer, so if everything is off by one hour, by one hour <laughs> we don't care. Um, okay, so this lets us, for example, implement the method after date, where we need to check, for example, to compare, so we have to manipulate, subtract, for example, subtracting time, we can no, subtracting some time. Query is before, is same. Okay, these are probably the one I need. We need to have a function that will tell us whether one date is before another or not, or they are equal. So we can use this is before and is same methods for creating the constructor function. The, sorry, the comparison function for sorting. Because they want also uh, oh, for filtering, not for sorting. So right now we just need to to filter. So the, our function that should be after date. So we go back to the object question. This dot after date is a function. They will take a date, uh, let's call it limit date, just to, not to call everything date, otherwise we get confused. I get a limit date, the minimum value, and then I should uh, return a filtered version of the answer list. So again, it will be this that answers filter and that will be the return value. I prefer first to write uh, the function call and then the callback because otherwise we'll get lost with the, all the nesting of the parameters. This filter requires a callback of course and the callback will take one element which will be a uh, answer object And it needs to return true or false, whether the date of the answer 
is after the limit date. So answer dot date, which is a DJS object. So it should have a method called is after, is after, another DJS object. So is after, DJS of limit date. So let's format it better. We are defining a function. This function contains a callback. And this is the result of the callback. So we may check whether all the answers after date uh, the beginning of the year, and then all the day all the answers after the date of uh, the first of June of this year. So again, in the first case, I should get one result, in the second case, you should get nothing if, if, if the function is working. So let's try it. And actually, it seems to be working because uh, in this case, I found one answer after the beginning of the, this year, and I found zero ans answers after June of this year. Okay, we, are, we only have one answer, so there's no surprise about which is. If we, if we add more or more answers, this filter should continue to work. Okay. And uh, the other two are actually the same thing. Uh, the difference is that uh, they returns uh, return sorted arrays which is not a problem we know the sort method the problem with the sort method is that uh, it modifies the array so we must be careful not to modify the original array but only return not only certain the result so we must uh, why um, filter is already doing a copy of the array for us, sort is not doing. So sort would modify something. So we need to make a copy ourselves. This is the only difference. So for example, if we want to implement a list by score, for example, so this dot list by score, we have a function where we have a minimum score. No, no. Uh, all of them, so we have no parameters. The, we are just sorting. And then, uh, so equal. We have a function body where we, it's not just an expression here. We need to create a value and then manipulate it and then return it. So we need braces where we define a copy uh, answers copy like this sorry a copy of this dot answers so we are creating a copy of the list it will not copy the element it will create a new array with the same references but then we can shuffle the reference around then we can sort that dot sort and the sorting criteria is decreasing number decreasing score so we already did that a b computes uh, a dot uh, 
score, sorry, B dot score. So that if B comes is, yes, is negative if B is lower. And then we return answers copy. Uh, just uh, don't return this, don't be too eager and try to return this because sort returns nothing, doesn't return a copy of the array. So we need to have it in separate statements. Okay, right now it doesn't uh, do a lot of work because we only have one answer. But uh, if we try to add more than the, on the only point here, uh, we're just reusing the same example that would be for sorting or something like that. The only difference is that just remember to make a copy. Otherwise, you're modifying the, the original list uh, that in the, in the object. That, okay. In, you it may be something you shouldn't do. Depends, of course, on the specification of these objects. But if other you know, uh, part of the program, just remember some location of the, of the answers, uh, they will get confused. Okay, and so the same will go for, for the dates. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, uh, type of code that we're writing in JavaScript to handle basic uh, data structures. List and objects uh, that also double as uh, dictionaries and arrays and so on. And with functions. We see that in, with functional programming, uh, it would be normal for us just to provide callbacks. We didn't write a single for loop. Or not even an if statement. And it was, of course, an exercise for this, for, but just remember that if we can reason at a higher level of abstraction than just uh, picking every element of an array, it would be better. Okay, so uh, on top of all this, I want to spend some time, not too much, but at least to introduce you to the next step. So we have, you have one week to get familiar with the callbacks and the closures uh, and uh, functional programming, okay. But from next week, uh, we'll try to do one step more of uh, defining asynchronous callbacks. So the idea would be the same, but the order of execution will be totally unexpected. Hmm? Uh, the idea is that well, JavaScript uh, is a language that uh, supports and suggests, basically, uh, an asynchronous style of programming. Just because it was born into the browser, and to, uh, when we have a user interface, everything is asynchronous. Okay, you have some animations going, you have some user clicking things, uh, and you have some computation in the background, you need to get some data from the server. So everything comes, uh, happens in, uh, uh, independently and asynchronously from each, other, from each other. So we will never have a, a synchronous code like this. Okay, like, like we are writing now. A JavaScript program starts and then usually doesn't end. We'll end only when the user closes the window. And uh, that is why it's so difficult. For example, we have no instruction for reading data. We have only the console that logs. So a real, a real input output from the console is not even a concept in, in JavaScript. Huh? Because normally the input output happens asynchronously with the user operation inside the browser. Or happens asynchronously with network, with network operations on a server. I get uh, an HTTP request and then I do a query into the database uh, and while I wait for the query to respond, I, ha I handle another request and so on. So everything <coughs> is asynchronous. Uh, we, we program basically the responses to many asynchronous events. Even if the JavaScript engine is a synchronous engine. So there is no multi-threading inside JavaScript. It's not a concurrent language but it can handle asynchronous activities, meaning that they are executed sequentially, but not in the order in which they are written. 
there's only one function, one line of code being of JavaScript being executed at a single time. Okay, there's no parallelism inside the, the JavaScript program. There is a synchronicity because uh, the order in which you are executing functions is not the order in which you are writing structure, and we'll see how. Um, this also means, is the, since there is no real parallelism, is that uh, we need uh, in our callbacks uh, to be quick to exit. Because every operation, every function we have will block the entire program. So, fast forward to the browser, if we have some computation to do in the browser, and this computation takes a long time, all the web page will be stuck. Users cannot scroll it, cannot write in it, because some JavaScript code is still working, and so uh, the JavaScript code cannot react to user actions. So uh, this increases the amount of asynchronicity we need to do, because when we have some operation which is potentially long, we need to schedule it asynchronously. So only have a bit of execution when some, there is actually some data to do, or we can shoot offload the computation to the server or something like that. Okay, so uh, the context in which JavaScript uh, operates is asynchronous, and also the single-threaded uh, nature forces us to uh, say use a synchronous solution whenever we need some do, do to do some slow operations, meaning network operation, database operation, something like that. And so all the libraries also work in this mode, in this way. And the first year when we did this course, we tried to do a, a, to find a library for doing some input console. There was no, no library that were, was synchronous. Synchronous means blocking the operation of the program until you write something. It's something that, uh, blocking the program is something that uh, JavaScript doesn't conceive. Okay? Um, Writing asynchronous code is no different uh, from the syntax point of view than uh, um, synchronous code. We just have some primitives that uh, create a synchronicity, and then we should manage it. For example, the simplest one is the timeout function. Set timeout. Set timeout is a function that gets a callback and, uh, uh, and the number. The number is a delay. So we already have, a, we already saw, mm. I used a lot uh, the callbacks, we, but they were synchronous callbacks. The callbacks of sort, for example, of filter was executed and called during the execution of the sort of the filter. When we are here, uh, this callback, for example, will be called many times only while we are calling filter. So we are sure that when the after date function is finished, there will be no more calls of this function. Okay? All the calls that we need to do will be before filter returns and before after date returns. This is synchronous. It happens as we write the call. With a timeout, the function will be executed not now, but after two seconds, 200 milliseconds. So the callback is scheduled now and will be executed later. Later, when uh, we don't know what the program will be doing at that time. We'll be doing something else, probably. Uh, and that, that's why we call it asynchronous, because when the callback will be executed, the program will be do something unpredictable, something different. JavaScript is still uh, single-threaded, so the, program, the main program should be doing something that can be interrupted. Okay, it doesn't happen in the middle of an instruction. So we don't have any problem like we have in concurrent programming at the low level when 
uh, different threads can modify the same shared memory location and create uh, bad values. We don't need semaphores or something like that here. Because the unit of, ex of execution in JavaScript uh, is the function. Okay? So a function will execute till the end and unless it will schedule something asynchronously that will be executed wholly, not just partially. Okay, so there are no um, surprises. No, you don't risk of your code being, ex being interrupted. This is good and it's bad. It's bad because if, you, if your code is low, nothing can interrupt it. It's good because you don't have any surprises. You don't risk of having one variable from line three that will be changed by some asynchronous task in line four. No. Since you are in your code, uh, the variable will not change. Um, and uh, the execution environments, uh, so Node.js and the browser, manage this so-called event loop. So scheduling a timeout means putting into a, a queue, a priority queue, that callback function. Say, so, okay, we have, we have time tag with that. We can be tagged by time or by events or something like that. So, okay, sooner or later we'll, uh, you will execute this function. As soon as possible, you will pull callbacks to be executed from the queue and execute them in some order, which doesn't need to be the order in which we have queued them. Because um, and okay, and so every operation, like we said, every operation that is low should be done asynchronously. But most of the cases it's not our choice. All the operations that are intrinsically slow are provided only in an asynchronous way by the libraries. There are no other ways. Okay? Um, and so we are forced to think and to use, uh, even if we have no hurry, for example, no? we are just a program. Right, written my computer, it's not a website yet, there's no user interaction, I just want to make a query and get the results. Okay, there's no way to make a query on a database in a synchronous way. It would be asynchronous. So we need to write asynchronous code even if we don't really need it. Just because the, 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 the mind of JavaScript and the mind of developers and the libraries is to try to follow this model. Um, from the point of view of the code, it doesn't look anything special. There's just callbacks that maybe are called in a different moment. For example, here uh, we will not use it, uh, uh, a library for reading from the console. And uh, I have a question here, I wrote a question, and I have a callback for handing the answer. The idea is that the, this function call cannot return any result because when I call this function the user still hasn't typed this response on the console and they cannot wait for the user to type so what I do here is to print the question and go forward with the program and so I will execute some instructions there but this instruction will not be able to know or to process the results. Because I'm writing here this instruction at uh, time zero, and uh, this instruction will be executed down here, will be executed at time 0 0.1 seconds immediately, and the answer will come at second three or four or five. So the idea is that when we call a function whose result is uh, slow, is asynchronous, the results will never be available after the function call. But we provide the function as a callback that will be called when the result is available. And only then. So the order of execution is I execute these instructions, I call this function, I do something else. When the user types and enters a date, uh, um, some input, then this function will be called. While the program is doing, I don't know what, something else. Okay. And of course, this function to, to do something useful must have some closure 
so that it can store or, or, or export the data. Because if I only call, call a function which is out of its context, uh, that function can only modify itself or do some print, but it's not very useful. So the important thing is that uh, we have also closures for asynchronous function. They work in the same way. When the function is called, it will still have access to some objects, to some variables that uh, were alive when the function was defined. But now we are not alive anymore. So it's not only that uh, I'm calling the callback from outside the function which it was created, like we did that in synchronous way. But nobody's calling the function. There's no function call explicitly in, a, in my code anymore. It would be called by some library function, not just outside the function which is defined, but also outside the module, outside my, of my code. Hmm? So it really has to work on its, on its own to do something useful. So let's, let's play a bit with the simplest ones, huh? okay? So for example, the timeout. Uh, timeout is a function that uh, is a, yes, a function that sets a, an asynchronous callback for some other code. So, for example, I want to say something after a given time. So, let's go back to our timer. Let's, let's call it. Dot JS. Sorry. Okay, so we have a program that sets a timer, set timeout. The timeout has one callback and one at minimum and one uh, time information. So let's say that we want just to write hello or write one, the number one, after one second, 1,000 milliseconds. Okay, if we run this program, you see that there's a wait time. I repeat, I run timers, the one doesn't appear immediately. I'm waiting one second, and then it will print, it will print. Node will wait until all the timer are expired before stopping the program. But what happens if I print a two here? The two will be executed, we will print it immediately. Then we have, a, we have a one second wait, and then we should get a one. Again, two, immediately, one second wait, and one. Okay, so this is the job of set timeout. Calling the callback that they provided after the given delay. And if I want, this callback could also schedule another one. For example, just to play with it, to make it more complicated. So I'm printing one, and then my, I'm, I'm scheduling another one, for example. Uh, where I'm printing uh, uh, three. After two seconds. And so I have the two, and then the one, two seconds wait, and then a three. And uh, three happens two seconds after the one, not two seconds after the beginning of the program, because the second timer is only scheduled, uh, because if I wanted, I could also move or duplicate this here, and we have a four. 
And so the four will happen two seconds after the start of the program. While the three will happen two seconds after printing the one. Let's see. Two, one, four, three. Two, one, four, three. There's no relationship between the order in which the functions are called and the order in which the functions are executed. Okay? So, of course, we, we cannot do anything really intelligent with just a timeout. No? Timeouts are used, for example, for doing animations so that we can schedule some movement of objects later on after a given number of milliseconds. Uh, for uh, you know default timing so we need to complete this operation with the given time after uh, after which we close it or something like that okay normally we, we don't want to wait for doing something we can do it right away but it's just it's just the simplest function that we can play with which has an asynchronous behavior you see the syntax is not different from writing filter or sort just providing a callback the only difference is that when the callback is called. The callback will be called, and just remember, when I call something asynchronous, uh, I, sh I must forget that I did in the next line. I cannot expect uh, Okay, and setting a variable and printing it, and nothing special. And inside this, I can change it to 44. I can do it because we have a closure that can access the variable A. But even if A44 is on line 6, uh, sorry, not 33, I want to log A, the value of A logged here will still be the old value. You see, it's still at 33. Of course, if, and even at the end of the program, eh, even at the end of the program, it will still be 33. Because the program is executed right away, immediately. All the instructions are executed. And then they are scheduling something that will happen in the background. Only after one second, A will become 44. And so if we happen to write it here, Maybe we get the 44. Yep, I saw that. Because that instruction at line 12 is executed in two seconds after the beginning of the program, and the setting A to 44 is executed uh, uh, one second after the beginning of the program. Of course, we will never play with race conditions like this. It's very dangerous to say, okay, this will happen this time, because these are just minimum times, by the way. We, don't, we have no guarantees, okay? Because maybe the processor is busy doing something else. This is a minimum delay. But the mindset that I try to have is when I'm doing something, when after I'm doing something that contains an asynchronous callback, I should forget about what I was doing. So every variable, that is being read or set during this timeout should never be used in, this, in the following lines of code. Because it will never have the value that we know, that we, that we want, that we'll, have, we'll finally have. But right now it doesn't have it yet. So launching a synchronous operation usually is the last thing you do. Or if you have to do something else, it's uh, most likely unrelated to the previous one. Because just, you just simply don't have the result. Okay. Uh, a friend of a set interval, a set interval, yes, is. Uh, sorry, what is that? Uh, we have set timeout that schedules an activity, 
and also set interval that schedules uh, a periodic set of activities. So set interval will run the callback, uh, not just once, but many times, infinitely many times, uh, uh, with that periodicity. So I want to run something every uh, 100 milliseconds. I set an interval or a callback uh, with 100 milliseconds. And so it will be executed, it will be called 10 times a second. Uh, set timeout will only call it once and forget about it. So set the interval will continue to call it uh, until you stop it. Okay. You can stop it because there is a function clear interval. We say, okay, stop, uh, we don't need it to do anymore. So these are the two basic functions for creating delayed behaviors. Um, the, something more interesting that we will do with uh, a synchronous operation will be to do something really useful, not just timeouts. We'll see uh, next week will be uh, accessing databases. So doing the queries in the database will be an asynchronous activity, and there we'll see some really useful asynchronous uh, call with all the problems that come with it. Okay, so that's the job for next uh, Tuesday. Thank you for today. Bye-bye.